Hello, I'm Brent Morris. I'm speaking from the Grand Commander's Chair in the Executive Chamber of the Supreme Council, 33rd Degree, Mother Council of the World of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. This is a particularly appropriate place for me to speak because I will be talking about the royal secret in America before 1801, the immediate predecessor of the Scottish Rite. May 31st, 1801 is the most significant date in the history of high degree masonry in the United States. On that day, the Mother Supreme Council of the World was opened by John Mitchell and Frederick Dalco in Charleston, South Carolina. <coughs> And in the course of the year, the whole number of Grand Inspectors General was completed agreeably to the Grand Constitutions. By this act, the Order of the Royal Secret of 25 Degrees, often called the Rite of Perfection, was transformed into the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite of 33 Degrees. Before the creation of the Mother Supreme Council, the High Degrees were spread through an inconsistent system of inspectors, each of whom could appoint an unrestricted number of inspectors without limit to authority. Records are scarce, but two inspectors seem to have been working in the Western Hemisphere before 1761. Lamalier de Fouillus made a, de a deputy prior to 1750 in France, and Bertrand Berthamieu made a deputy by Fouillus in 1753 in the West Indies. It is not known if Fouillus or Berthamieu appointed further inspectors. In 1761, Etienne Morin received a patent at Paris that authorized him to propagate the right throughout the world. He arrived in Jamaica in 1762 or 1763 and soon appointed six inspectors general, including Henry Andrew Franken as a deputy inspector general. Franken in turn established a lodge of perfection in Albany, New York in 1767 and created six other deputy inspectors general. He also prepared at least three books with the rituals translated into English. Eventually, 52 inspectors descended from Franken, and at least 75 inspectors were appointed in America before 1801. The inspectors and deputies did more than reproduce themselves. They conferred the ineffable, fourth degree to fourteenth, and sublime, fifteenth degree and above, upon master masons and occasionally established bodies. Again, records are scarce, but at least the following eight bodies were established before 1801. 1764, Loge de Parfait d'Ecosse, New Orleans, Louisiana. 1767, The Ineffable Lodge of Perfection, Albany, New York. 1781, The Lodge of Perfection, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 1783, Lodge of Perfection, Charleston, South Carolina. 1788, Grand Council, Princes of Jerusalem, Charleston, South Carolina. 1791, King Solomon's Lodge of Perfection, Holmes Hole, now Tisbury, Island of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. 1792, Lodge of Perfection, Baltimore, Maryland. 1797, Sublime Grand Council, Princes of the Royal Secret, Charleston, South Carolina. These basic facts of high degree activity before the creation of the Supreme Council are well known and have been repeated in many places. What they fail to do is to, form us how, is to inform us how the high degrees appeal to American Masons, how the inspectors spread the degrees, and how the bodies operated. The answer to these questions help us understand the acceptance of the Mother Supreme Council. The craft or blue degrees were being conferred by 1733 in America, and 23 and 20 years later, in December 1753, Fredericksburg Lodge in Virginia recorded the first conferral anywhere of the Royal Arch degree. American Master Masons soon realized that they had not received the entire account of the Master's word, and that the Royal Arch was required to complete the story. Royal Arch Masonry became popular as more Masons sought to complete their Masonic knowledge. The steady spread of the Royal Arch was aided by the growing dominance in America of ancient lodges that conferred the degree on the authority of their craft warrants. At least five chapters independent of lodges were created by 1794. The Grand Chapter of Pennsylvania was instituted in 1795, and the General Grand Chapter of New England States was formed in 1796. 
The first Knight Templar conferral was in 1769, and there is sporadic evidence of the order until 1796 when the first encampment, now a commandery, was formed in Connecticut. The ten degrees and orders of what has come to be known as the American York Rite were summarized and given wide publicity in Thomas Smith Webb's Freemason's Monitor or Illustrations of Masonry, 1797. American Masons enthusiastically pursued further light in Masonry, but because the Order of the Royal Secret was of French origin and had no tradition in English lodges, these high degrees were little known. These ceremonies must have seemed like alluring rumors, only available from remote non-English lodges or from traveling Masonic lecturers. The fragmentary knowledge of sublime masonry was aided by occasional tantalizing mentions in Masonic books. The first American book on masonry was Benjamin Franklin's 1734 reprint of Anderson's Constitutions of the Freemasons. A total of 626 volumes dealing with Freemasonry were published in America through 1800. Ten of these dealt with precursors of the Scottish Rite. For the interested student of Masonry, these ten books provide hints of knowledge beyond that found in lodges of English origin. 1787. The Memorial of Lodge No. 40 on the Registry of Pennsylvania to the Right Worshipful Grand Lodge. This ten-page pamphlet is a complaint to the Grand Lodge of Ancient York Masons of South Carolina, the Ancients Grand Lodge, uh, was a complaint that the... This ten-page pamphlet is a complaint that the Grand Lodge of Ancient York Masons of South Carolina was formed irregularly. However, page five gives intriguing hints of a form of Freemasonry different from that in England. Quote, Brother Joseph Myers, Jr. was then, and actually is, under the jurisdiction of the late Prussian monarch, an inspector general and grand master of and over the ineffable degrees of masonry. The second, Brother James Fallon, is and was a regular past master, made and installed in a lodge of ineffable masons in Philadelphia under a regular commission. 1797, the tomb of James Molay. This is a 22-page translation of the 1796 French original. Page 8 explains that Jacques de Molay established four chapters with 27 members each who have special privileges in Masonic lodges. Quote, when they enter a lodge, they have the exclusive right of crossing in the middle of the carpet, which is opposite the throne. All Freemasons of lodges are ignorant of who they are. 1797, Thomas Smith Webb the Freemasons' Monitor or Illustrations of Masonry. This was the first American monitor of Masonic degrees, giving prayers, charges, and non-secret portions of ritual. It was widely distributed, translated into Spanish, and went through several editions before Webb's death. Part two of this book has descriptions of the 11 degrees of a Lodge of Perfection on pages 227 to 66 including information about who replaced Hiram Abiff at King Solomon's Temple, how the ruffians were dealt with, and how the lost word was recovered. Webb's monitor was extremely influential in establishing and disseminating the standard American ritual. Its widespread popularity must have brought the sublime degrees to the curious attention of many American Masons. 1798, John Robinson, Proofs of a Conspiracy Against All the Religions and Governments of Europe. This is the first American edition of this influential book, which created hysteria at the idea that the Illuminati were secretly infiltrating the governments of the world, and possibly America. On page 384, Robinson comments on Abbe Baruel's rituals of the Night of the Sun and Night Rose Croix. Here is another instance of tantalizing references to Masonic degrees unfamiliar to most American Masons. 1798, John Robinson proves a con of a conspiracy, the second American edition of his work. 1799, Augustine de Baruel, Memoir, Memoirs Illustrating the History of Jacobinism, volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4. Because there were three separate printers for the four volumes, Kent Walgram assigns each a separate entry in his bibliography. There are, more provoking, uh, there are more provoking hints of unseen forces in Freemasonry. Occult lodges, or hidden lodges, which Baruel termed Arrières lodges, uh, in, volume, 
In volume two, the reader can find descriptions of the degree of elect, knight of the sun, higher degrees of scotch masonry, degree of rose croix, mystical masonry, and knight kadosh. Volume three deals specifically with, with Weishaupt's degrees of Illuminism, but to the general Masonic reader, it all points to even more continental degrees unknown to English lodges. Further mention of continental degrees is in volume four, the African Brethren, Knights of the Eagle, the Adept, the Sublime Philosopher, Knights of Palestine, Knights Kadosh, Scotch Directory, Scotch Architect. 1800, Robert Griffith Wetmore, a feeble attempt to promote the felicity of Campbell's Mark Masters Lodge in Dunsborough, New York. On page six, Wetmore says, quote, when I first became your neighbor, I was in possession of 30 degrees in masonry, including those styled ineffable, and therefore consider myself as having arrived to the Ni Plus Ultra. Webb's Freemason's Monitor was the first authoritative guide to working the 10 degrees and orders of American York Rite. Craft degrees, three, Royal Arch, four degrees, and Knights Templar, three orders. It also gave exciting information about an exotic type of masonry known to few American masons and must have generated great curiosity among its readers. At that time, a typical Amer American lodge room was rather simply decorated with pillars in the west, an altar in the center, and an illuminated G in the east. Compare this austerity with the lavish description Webb gives for just one of the ineffable degrees. Observations on the degree of Provo and Judge. This lodge is adorned with red and lighted by five great lights, one in each corner and one in the center. The master is placed in the east under a blue canopy surrounded with stars and is styled thrice illustrious. The worshipful master of an American craft or blue lodge wore his usual, usual clothes with a ribbon around his neck from which hung a square. His apron was probably homemade and decorated by his wife, sister, or mother. There are many images of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin in such simple but dignified attire. Again, compare the description Webb gives to the luxurious dress of the presiding officer of the degree of Knights of the Ninth Arch or Royal Arch. The most potent Grand Master representing Solomon in the East is seated in a chair of state under a rich canopy with a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand. He is dressed in royal robes of yellow and an ermine divestment of blue satin, reaching to his elbows. A broad purple ribbon from the right shoulder to the left hip to which is hung a triangle of gold. After being enticed since the 1760s with allusions to and hints of mysterious Masonic degrees preserving the full story of the craft, American Masons were given clear information in 1802. The Mother Supreme Council published its circular throughout the two hemispheres, announcing itself and explaining the degrees under its control. The circular can be viewed as a wonderfully written sales brochure, enticing candidates to join by explaining why the ineffable and sublime degrees are necessary to fully understand Freemasonry. It gave many examples of why the high degrees are both superior and essential. The Supreme Council alone is governed with historically correct documents. Much of the history of Masonry in the early ages is so mixed with fable and enveloped with the rust of time that little satisfaction can be obtained. But as we approach nearer to our own times, we have authentic records for our government. Another point, the first three degrees are only a preparation for the higher degrees. Quote, the three first or blue degrees were formed as the test of character and capacity of the initiated before they should be admitted to the knowledge of more important mysteries. The true master's word was lost to the blue degrees with the death of Hiram Abiff, but the ineffable and sublime degrees still possess it. Quote, it is well known to the blue master that King Solomon and his royal visitor were in possession of the real and pristine word, but of which he must remain ignorant unless initiated into the sublime degrees. Another point. The ineffable and sublime degrees have preserved their ceremonies uncorrupted. Quote, Much variety and irregularity have unfortunately crept into the blue degrees in consequence of those who are unacquainted with the Hebrew language, in which all the words and passwords are given. Not so the superior degrees. 
they appear in that sublime dress which their founders gave them. Another point, the ineffable and sublime degrees continue the tradition of the Crusaders and base their degrees on authentic records discovered in Palestine. Quote, while 27,000 Masons accompanying the Christian princes in the Crusades were in Palestine, they discovered several important Masonic manuscripts among the descendants of the ancient Jews, which enriched our archives with authentic written records and on which some of our degrees are founded. <coughs> From the introduction of the Royal Arch in 1753 to the circular throughout the two hemispheres in 1802, American Masons had been advised directly and indirectly that the craft degrees didn't tell the entire story of Masonry. Not every Mason was induced to pursue, to pursue further light, but for those that were, it must have been challenging to know when to stop. Suggestions of yet one further rep revelation, perhaps the Ni Plus Ultra, might come with the next visitor from overseas, and the latest publication, or at the hands of an itinerant Masonic lecturer. Freemasonry came to the United States from many sources and in varied forms. The early lodges had little guidance for their rituals and ceremonies, probably relying on equal doses of oral tradition and written and printed exposures. Four, written exp uh, four ritual exposures were published in America before 1801, all reprints of American orig originals, uh, all, all reprints of English originals. The Mystery of Freemasonry in 1730, Masonry Dissected, 1749-1750, Hiram or the Grand Master Key, 1768, and Jochen and Boaz, 1774 through 1801. These are the dates that the editions appeared in the United States. Prior to the publication of Morgan's work, Illustrations of Masonry by one of the fraternity in 1826, Jochen and Boaz was the most important expose published on American soil and greatly aided ritual uniformity. While there were doubtless other imported exposures available, it was exposure of the ancient working of Jochen and Boaz that most influenced American ritual. It went through ten editions before 1801, while the other three American exposures were never reprinted. We may infer from its popularity that Jochen and Boaz was used widely, if informally, by American lodges to guide their rituals. Nature abhors a vacuum, and into the vacuum of American Masonic ritual appeared itinerant Masonic lecturers. These uniquely American entrepreneurs traveled the country teaching uniform workings of the three craft degrees. The first four of the American Royal Arch, Mark Master Mason, Past Master, Most Excellent Master in Royal Arch, and Side Degrees. The great unifier of American ritual was Thomas Smith Webb, who is known to have used Jochen and Boaz to teach his students. Webb formalized the ceremonies in Jochen and Boaz, adjusted the language to American vernacular, and filled in the procedural gaps. He extended the language and forms of his craft work to the Royal Arch and taught and certified other lecturers. In 1797, Webb published the Freemason's Monitor, which was a teaching tool that helped cement his ritual codification. As noted before, it also must have piqued interest in the high degrees. Little is known about the business practices of American Masonic, of, of Masonic lecturers, but we can make some reasonable inferences from the 1782 to 1808 register of Abraham Jacobs and the 1817 to 1820 diary of Jeremy Ladcross. If we assume that each inspector of the Order of the Royal Secret was an itinerant lecturer of some sort, then perhaps a total of 100 to 150 such peddlers offered their services to Masonic bodies and individual Masons. In addition to lecturing on the craft and royal arch degrees, which meant teaching the ritual and floor work from memory, these lecturers sold or gave side degrees to their customers and chartered various bodies under their authority. Jeremy Cross's diary gives us a good idea about the business of a successful lecturer. While his, diaries, while his diary entries are for 1817 to 1820, finances then could not have been to, too different from the period before 1801. His fee for lecturing for a day in 1817 seems to have been $4, about $55 in 2003. He established councils of select masters for $20, about $275 today. 
He became a Masonic lecturer in 1814, but by 1818 was still in debt and hoping to settle down. On August 17, 1817, he started out from Haverhill, New Hampshire, traveled by coach and boat, and arrived in Richmond, Virginia on December 4th, a trip of 635 miles. He often stayed with Masons and regularly dined with them, even when he stayed in a hotel. During the 17-week trip to Richmond, he established at least six councils of select masters. That would be $120, or $1,650 in today's money and spent some 29 days lecturing in lodges and chapters. That's about $116 for lecturing fees, or $1,595. His total income for the trip down to Richmond was about $236, or $3,245 in today's money. To get a very rough estimate of his expenses, note that during his stay in Washington, D.C., he paid $8.75, for three and a half days room and meals at Thomas Crawford's Union Hotel, or $2.50 per day. The cost for lodging in smaller towns must have been less, say $1.50 to $2 a day. If he used hotels or taverns for one half to two thirds of his trip and stayed with brothers the rest of the time, then he spent about $90 to $160 on lodging, very nearly half his income. By the time we add in his transportation and miscellaneous expenses, it's easy to see why, after four years of lecturing, he was still in debt. A $4 lecturing fee appears to have been the accepted rate. The Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, on July 22, 1805, appointed Benjamin Gleason to be the Grand Lecturer, and after one year lecturing the Massachusetts Lodges, he received $1,000, or about $15,600 in 2003 money. If Gleason lectured about 21 days a month, and he received about, uh, then he received about the same compensation per lecture as Cross. Cross's fortunes as a lecturer significantly improved on May 1818, when the Grand Lodge of Connecticut appointed him Grand Lecturer to visit, several lodge, to visit the several lodges in this jurisdiction and instruct them in the correct mode of working and lecturing and that each subordinate lodge be required to pay into the treasury of the Grand Lodge the sum of $10 at or before the next Grand Communication for the purpose of defraying the expenses of such visitation. Further, each lodge will pay Brother Cross's expenses when actually employed by the lodge in giving lectures and instructions, and no lodge shall be bound to pay said sum of $10 unless they first have the benefit of said lectures at, at least two and a half days. Cross was now making the standard $4 per day plus expenses, and he had more or less guaranteed employment with each of the Connecticut lodges. In 1818, there were about 58 lodges in Connecticut, which would generate about $580 or 9,000 or about 9,000 in lecturing fees. He also instituted about a dozen uh, councils of select masters for another $240 or 3,744. Another boost to his prosperity came in 1819 when he published The True Masonic Chart or Hieroglyphic Monitor. This popular book went through eight editions by 1850 and was followed by The Templar's Chart or Hieroglyphic Monitor in 1820. Two editions were out by 1850. And, a business, and he had a business of selling engraved aprons and other Masonic supplies. Abraham Jacobs does not appear to have lectured in the craft degrees, nor does his register indicate what his fees were. However, we know that Cross and Gleason received $4 per day to instruct in the seven craft and Royal Arch degrees at about the same time, and that Cross received $20 to establish a council of select masters, conferring only one degree. Further, in 1806, Antoine Bedode of the Southern Supreme Council conferred the 4th through 32nd degree in New York City on J.J.J. J. J. Gorgas and four others for $46, or about $1.50 per degree. Thus, this is not unreasonable to suppose that Jacobs received to $10 to $20 per individual when he conferred the 13 degrees of the Lodge of Perfection and the Council of Princes of Jerusalem, perhaps giving a discount for larger classes of candidates. On November 9, 1760, Moses Cohen initiated Jacob, a knight of the sun, with full power to initiate brethren and constitute lodges. And this is what Jacob did. 
He conferred the ineffable sublime and other sublime, sublime degrees to supplement his income from teaching Hebrew. While his register gives no information about his income, it does give us insight as to how he conferred degrees, from which we conjecture the methods of other inspectors. On 19 days, from June 10th to July 3rd, 1792, Jacobs conferred the 13 degrees of secret master through Prince of Jerusalem on 16 brothers in Augusta, Georgia. His register entry for June 14th was typical of how the degrees were conferred. June 14th, this day conferred the degrees of Provo and Judge on Brother Zimmerman and Prescott, also the degrees of Tendon of the Building or Grand Master in Israel. Brother James Gardner attended and received the degrees of Secret Master and Perfect Master with every requisite instruction. Usually one or two degrees were conferred each evening, but since not everyone could be present, degrees were repeated, as on June 14th. Jacobs had no assistance in conferring the degrees, and so the, the ceremonies were anything but full form. It is reasonable to ask, why did it take so many evenings to confer the degrees? The ex explanation may be in the phrase from, the June, four, from June 14th in Jacobs' register, quote, with every requisite instruction. Arturo de Hoyas, Grand Archivist and Grand Historian of the Supreme Council for the Southern Jurisdiction, believes that Jacobs dictated the ceremonies to the candidates, and they transcribed the rituals for their personal use. In support of this contention, the archives of the Supreme Council for the Southern Jurisdiction have several small, unbound books, cahiers, with individual de <clears throat> degrees transcribed into them. Consider the title page of one undated book with the Night of Kadosh rituals written on 58 of 64 by, uh, of 12 by 16 and a half centimeter pages. Here's what the title page says. Knight of Kadosh, or White and Black Eagle, Inspector of All Lodges, Grand Elect, 24th, and then 24th is struck out. And underneath it, it says, 29th degree, Grand Elect, Knight of Kadosh. What is significant with the 24th is, is marked out and replaced by 29th. Prior to 1801, the degree of Kadosh was the 24th in the order of the royal secret. But the circular throughout the two hemispheres lists the Kadosh as the 29th degree, and it later becomes the 30th. Thus, De Hoyitz dates the manuscript to sometime before 1801. It was prepared under the aegis of the order of the royal secret, but soon after, its owner must have transferred allegiance to the new Supreme Council, and the ritual was renumbered and renamed in a different hand. Note that it is only necessary to renumber degrees above the 22nd degree, Prince of Libanus, since the two systems agree through there. And it is only such renumbered degree books that can be confidently dated as being written before 1801. The Supreme Council invited all holders of patents from the Order of the Royal Secret to turn them in and receive a patent from the new body. Few of these books are extant for probably several reasons. First, there were never very many recipients of these degrees as witnessed by the few bodies established before 1801 and the paucity of comments in Grand Lodge proceedings. Next, during the American anti-Masonic period of 1826-42, to 42, renouncing Masons were encouraged to destroy all of their Masonic paraphernalia. Finally, no less an authority than Albert Pike encouraged the destruction of earlier and unapproved versions of Scottish Rite degrees and recommended, quote, old and worthless cahiers of degrees be committed to the flames. We can now assemble a model of how the inspectors spread the high degrees. Armed with their patents, they gathered from one to several candidates, summarized the degree ceremonies, and taught the words and grips. After each abbreviated ceremony, the inspectors dictated the ritual to the new members who, who transcribed them for their personal use. Some inspectors, like Abraham Jacobs, encourage their candidates to apply for warrants from appropriate authority, though obviously few followed through. Unfettered by Grand Lodge regulations, the inspectors were free to peddle their wares wherever they found willing candidates. They, their customers, either lured by sales pitches for exclusive degrees, or drawn by the promise of further light and masonry, eagerly paid for the information. The degrees were conferred as well as possible by the inspector, with perhaps a few brothers assisting. The new candidates were then permitted to transcribe the rituals for their later study and use, perhaps in organizing a high-degree body with a warrant. 
How did the high degrees operate before 1801? Well, according to the first U.S. Census in 1790, the total population of the United States was 3,893,635, and the five large, largest cities were New York City, 33,000, Philadelphia, 29,000, Boston, 18,000, Charleston, 16,000, and Baltimore, 14,000. Five high-degree bodies were located in three of the five largest American cities, with Charleston alone accounting for three bodies. Albany, with 3,500, was the 19th largest American city and had one body. The surprise location for a high-degree body is Holmes Hole on the island of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. The 1790 census shows only about 350 people in the town, though the surrounding Dukes County had a population of 3,245, which, if it were a city, would have ranked it as the 20th largest in the United States. These bodies of the Order of the Royal Secret were mostly located in the largest urban centers, which should have given them excellent exposure to Masons. We have very few extant records of any of these bodies. The first Hautes Grades body in the U.S. was established in New Orleans. Loge de Parfait de Cosse opened there on Ju April 12, 1764, and, woke, and worked, quote, the Bordeaux system. But being first, it did not guarantee longevity. Shortly after France ceded New Orleans to Spain through the 1763 Treaty of Paris, Freemasonry either went underground or died out completely in the city. Only one document remains of Parfait's, Parfait's de Cos, the minutes of two meetings. We know nothing about its operations or influence. The Hotzgrades did not formally return to New Orleans until 1807. The ineffable Lodge of Perfection of Albany was chartered by Henry Andrew Franken in 1768. Its register is in the archives of the Supreme Council, 33rd degree, Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, and records 123 meetings from 1768 to 1774, with no meetings held in 1772. The extant minutes are banal and do not reflect the promise of the sublime perfection of craft masonry. The minute book of the Lodge of Perfection in Philadelphia, established by Solomon Bush, has been preserved by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania and was reprinted in 1915. It records the meetings from the first in 1781 to the abrupt last one in 1789. While the members did write to Frederick the Great, the proceedings are otherwise unexceptional. Isaac da Costa organized the sublime Grand Lodge of Perfection in Charleston in 1783. Quote, on the 13th of June, 5796, the lodge room, records, jewels, and furniture of the ineffable lodge of perfect and sublime masons were consumed by fire, which added to other causes suspended the meeting of the sublime lodge, except some occasional ones for special purposes. Five years after da Costa organized the Lodge of Perfection in Charleston, Berend M. Spitzer, Abraham Forst, and Joseph M. Myers opened the Grand Council of Princes of Jerusalem in 1788 in the city. Its jurisdiction over lodges of perfection and councils of princes of Jerusalem was recognized by at least Abraham Jacobs, who instructed his initiates, his initiates to apply to Charleston for a charter. King Solomon's Lodge of Perfection at Holmes Hole, now Tisbury, on the island of Martha's Vineyard, was created by Moses Michael Hayes, Deputy Inspector General, in 1791, when he was serving as Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, the Ancients. In 1797, the body surrendered its charter to the Grand Lodge and received a new charter with the same name, but solely as a craft lodge. King Solomon's Lodge of Perfection surrenders jewels, charter, and records in 1822, and all were destroyed when the Grand Lodge in Boston burned. Henry Wilmans, Grand Inspector General, established a Lodge of Perfection in Baltimore, but the only remaining document is the Constitution and law, Laws of the Grand Elect Perfect and Sublime Masons, signed by 27 members in 1792, four of whom became Grand Master of Maryland. There is a reference in 1804 to Concordia Lodge No. 13 of Baltimore settling a rent account with the Sublime Lodge for $150. This seems to indicate that the Lodge of Perfection survived at least 12 years. Nothing else is known about it. Charleston became the center of American high-degree masonry in 1797 
when a sublime grand council of princes of the royal secret was opened there under the authority from Hi of Hyman Isaac Long. This was the last high degree body to be formed before 1801. The only ineffable or sublime bodies still working in 1801 were probably in Baltimore and definitely in Charleston. While not many of these bodies survived more than a few years, those in Charleston provided the fertile ground from which emerged the Supreme Council of the United States. Most of these high degree bodies operated near several blue lodges and other bodies. Their mere presence brought the sublime degrees to the attention of other Masons in their area, but attention was not enough to ensure success or interest. Bodies of the Royal Secret before 1801 operated without any central direction. There was no state or national leadership. In contrast, there were Grand Lodges in 12 of the original states by 1791, with Delaware forming its Grand Lodge in 1806. Some Grand Lodges permitted their lodges to work the, the mark, Royal Arch, and other degrees by virtue of their warrants. By 1801, the York Rite was beginning to take off. There were grand chapters of Royal Arch Masons in at least seven states. Royal Arch Masonry was seen as the logical and natural extension of craft masonry, and the Knights Templar had a grand encampment in the city of Philadelphia. A subtle but important distinction between operations of the York Rite and the Order of the Royal Secret may be that the ineffable and sublime degrees had an intellectual appeal. While the York Rite, especially the chapter degrees, had popular elements of boisterous fun. This difference can be seen by the willingness of initiates of the Order of the Royal Secret to pay for the privilege of just transcribing rituals. Certainly a scholarly approach to masonry of great appeal to the literate. Few of the men elevated by inspectors participated in meetings because there were hardly any bodies for them to attend, but they seemed to be satisfied to read and study the rituals. We really don't know what happened during pre-1801 American Masonic meetings, but the exposures of the American anti-Masonic period, about 1826 to 1842, let us make tenuous inferences about that uh, earlier era. David Bernard's Light on Masonry was the major exposure of the time, going through five increasingly detailed editions between April and December 1829. And Avery Allen's A Ritual of Freemasonry in 1831 was his chief competitor. Both books sought to destroy the fraternity by exposing its rituals and portraying it in the worst possible light. Thus, any negative depiction must be considered in light of the author's ultimate goal. Their descriptions reflected local ritual variants that may or may not have been widely popular. Arturo de Hoyas points out that such variants were an expected consequence of the York Rite's traditions of mouth-to-ear ritual. The written tradition of the ineffable and sublime degrees allows much less variation. If Bernard and Allen's exposures can be believed, the degrees of a Royal Arch chapter offered participants rowdy, mischievous initiation pranks. These degrees, especially the Royal Arch, provided a logical conclusion to the Master Mason degree, while seemingly providing some innocent fun during the ceremonies, a popular combination much more successful than merely transcribing and studying degrees. Their descriptions of the Royal Arch Chapter degrees, the most widely worked of the high degrees, tell of several opportunities to embarrass and surprise the candidates. Allen even provided comical drawings of the ceremonies highlighting the discomfiture of the candidate. In contrast with the chapter degrees, their descriptions of the eleven ineffable degrees are austere and solemn, almost like historical plays. Bernard had advanced to the sixth degree, intimate secretary, and Allen had received none of the ineffable and sublime degrees, so they had little first-hand evidence of what went on in a lodge of perfection. However, neither author would have missed an opportunity to emphasize any negative aspect even rumored. The simplicity of their descriptions supports the idea that the ceremonies were indeed serious without amusing features for observers. The ineffable and sublime degrees may not have spread rapidly because they lacked the humorous initiation possibilities of the Royal Arch Chapter degrees. We will likely never know. The Supreme Council of the United States appeared at a time when American Masons were becoming aware there was Masonic knowledge beyond the craft lodges. This awareness was spread by itinerant lecturers, books, and bodies of the Order of the Royal Secret. The Order, with its largely uncontrolled inspectors, lacked the organizational infrastructure to, su to survive. 
Its daughter, the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite, had the characteristics that guarantee greatness. In 200 years, it has grown to become the largest and most widespread branch of the Masonic fraternity. Today, it has even greater possibilities of greatness than in 1801. I am indebted to two of my fellow Mackey scholars who have generously given me invaluable assistance in the preparation of this paper. Illustrious brother Arturo de Hoyos, 33rd degree, Grand Archivist and Grand Historian, Supreme Council, 33rd degree, Southern Jurisdiction, provided me with support, inspiration, and guidance through many conversations about the order of the royal secret. Illustrious brother Alain Bernheim, 33rd degree, refined my references and suggested important enhancements to the text. Thank you very much.